Hi everybody, uh, today we have on the channel uh, Mr. Tay Chi King. Chi yeah. King is a full-time financial <laughs> content creator. Um, okay, he'll introduce himself basically. Okay, the reason why um, I bring an expert on like, like Chi King here, uh, the reason why is because um, he's a full-time content creator in the financial space. So he studies stocks, equities, probably different asset classes and stuff like that. And uh, these people like that, experts like this, like you want to hear their, their opinion, right? Because they do it every single day, day in and day out. Yeah. So, uh, Chi King, thank you for your time. Um, could you first, I guess, introduce yourself, um, tell the audience who you are and uh, right. like, who do you serve? Yeah. Right. So I think before that, um, I actually met John maybe a year and a half back. So he was actually running a podcast and he got me on. Uh, back then, I'm still a very fresh guy because I was still in university and I just graduated. So what I currently do now, um, I'm essentially a content specialist. So I basically research um, a lot of the companies in the investable universe. And I'm currently with Adam, so I'm not too sure if you guys know. He also runs a very successful channel. Um, yeah, I mainly do a lot of the research content and uh, basically if Adam asks me to look into a specific space, um, I'll help him with that. And for myself, um, I actually did run a YouTube channel as well. Still am running. Um, I cover mainly, I think, in the China equity space. Um, personally, for me, I do have an interest there and I do see a very interesting risk-reward um, right now. So yeah, I've been doing that for at least the past two plus years now. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's generally. Okay, can, can, can you give the audience a bit of your like, uh, academic background as well? Okay, so I think I recently just graduated from NTU, so the Nanyang Business School. I took a double degree in accounting and finance. So that's generally my area of expertise, looking at balance sheet, cash flow statements, doing some sort of analysis and discounting and stuff. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, okay, Chiki, I know you are known for Bama, we'll, we'll go to that topic sure. later on, but <laughs> first of all, um, the people in the audience here, for example, they are like uh, e com guys, business mm. owners, entrepreneurs and stuff, and then, for example, if they have like a couple of hundred K or a few mil sitting in a bank, liquid, stuff like that, um, obviously in business, you, you can control your destiny, right? right. And, and you can really grow your returns and stuff right. like that, uh, but at a certain point, you also kind of want to retire and you want to uh, make your, your best passive investments work mm. for yourself. So, in that situation, could you advise people on like how should they deploy their money? Because their skill set, their their background is coming from I'm building businesses, I build teams, I right. structure them as skilled businesses and stuff. But financial analysts is like completely different thing. So could you give advice on that? Yeah. I think this really depends on I can't give a broad based advice because we, we can't really give financial advice. But I think generally you have that that two school two two random uh, two distinct school of thoughts i think the first path is always the passive investment we talk about going to etf getting 7 8% that's really the hands off approach but to be very very honest um, if you really talk about trying to trying to outperform the market or beat the market um, it's no easy feat but it is evident that actually quite a few people at least in the retail investing space do do it uh, so so in that perspective right um, you really need to know where your interest is aligned. So if you're in the, in the business of trying to build teams and really build up and scale your businesses, right? That's your main source of income. Correct. But that's it. You probably want to also start building up a portfolio, whether is it a dividend portfolio or whether is it uh, more specifically looking at capital gains. Um, you need to kind of understand or study through the different school of thoughts. For myself, I do stock picking because that's basically my full-time job and I enjoy it. Okay. I, I, I gain a lot of passion and and enjoyment or fulfillment from doing it. But if you look at it from the perspective that um, you are running a business, yeah, at the same time, you also are interested in building a portfolio of stocks. I do think you kind of still want to do a, a more concentrated nature. And depending on how aggressive or, or how, how deep you study the companies, right? Yep. Um, uh, I, I still try to err in the, the, the side of caution, um, at least build a, a portfolio of at least 10 to 15 stocks and go into high conviction bets. So by high conviction bets, to be very, very honest, because you guys are in the e-com space, you know very well the advertising space. You know, you, you get win or you know which company is gonna perform and underperform. And you have a very close proximity to the businesses itself. So I think you might wanna even start from that space or that, that area of expertise because that's your circle of competence. Yep. So that's a very important, important logic. The second is try to diversify a bit and, and try to do a little bit more research. Whether it's even, even in the adjacent space, I think that's a very interesting perspective where advertising is one, then you have um, people in e-com, Amazon, um, Shopify, st stuff like that. And then you can even um, try to look into other um, diversified spaces as well yep. and to kind of build a diversified portfolio. Yep. Um, and, and I think to really go down deeper into the advice, right, you really need to understand what's your objective as, as a person. Like, do you want to retire earlier? you want to double, triple, quadruple your, your, your portfolio? Or do you want a very steady stream of income to go into dividend investing and stuff like that? Yep. But generally for me, if you are really looking at a profile like yourself, um, 20 plus, 30 plus in your early 20s, 30s, and you want really aggressive um, um, 
kind of returns, then you need to be very aggressive in your in your in the way you deploy your capital as well. Mm. And there was this recent concept that I came through. I don't know whether you know this this idea of hundred bagger. So really trying to find companies that go hundred x. Yep. But in order to really get that kind of returns, right? You this need is in the DC space. Yeah. You you need to. It, it's a very specific sliver of Correct. Um, investment silos. Correct. Uh, I, I can go into that kind of logic or theory later on. But yeah, I think this is just generally how I look at it. Okay. Mm. So I mean, uh, b- being aggressive in a sense also is is relative, right? Because. Uh, I can tell you my, my family members are very conservative. Right. <laughs> so conservative to, to the fact that, for example, like they, don't, they don't even invest, for example. Okay. So it's crazy to me. Okay. But uh, stuff where it's like, um, can you tell people what what would you consider aggressive? And like you said, the risk profile is 20 to 30s. Okay, 20 to 30s, right? To be very, very honest now, if you look at um, how we are basically depo- deploying capital in the grander scheme of things, um, to me, I think even running a concentrated portfolio where you, let's say you have 100,000 100, today, um, running 10k each, uh, it's not too big a deal because that's the amount of portfolio that I actually, actually don't even find it concentrated enough that, that you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think if you start running in the one million range, so maybe you have a one million dollar portfolio, hundred thousand might be a little bit more concentrated yeah. because it's relative to your income potential and Correct. how much money Correct. you earn, right? So that's why it's very hard to give an advice. But like you said, if we try to do a, a, a portfolio planning for somebody in their twenties with hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand, yep. Um, I, I would still try to recommend to try to be a bit more diversified. So if you want to do a 40-50% on a high conviction play, um, like 50k, sure, go ahead. In fact, that's what I'm doing. Mm. I'm running a 50-60k on, on one particular investment thesis. Okay. Um, but that's it. Uh, it, it, it. Is that why, is the reason why because you, you really don't care or like you just got time, right? Or right. it's that uh, you're just super confident. <laughs> Like what's I think confidence is relative as well, depending on the okay. amount of time you, you put in, right? Yep. So to me, I do see as like, let's say I put 50, 60K into an investment. Um, in order for my time to pay off, like if it doubles or triples, it has to go to 250. It, yeah, it has to. Minimum. Yeah, yeah it, has to, it has to kind of pay off in terms of my time. Correct. That's one. And number two, I think relative to income perspective, because we are all starting out. So we still have a very long time horizon and the potential for you to earn is a lot more. So that's why I'm willing to take a little bit more risk in, in that sense. Yeah, okay. but of course, for somebody that is a lot older in the age spectrum, yep. uh, not advisable totally yep. to, to, to go into such an aggressive bet. Yeah, okay. So to me, aggressive, I think sinking 50-60% of the portfolio considered quite aggressive. It is. It's, yeah. it's effing aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you disclose about your stories? Sorry? Can you disclose about your stories? Uh, oh, it's Alibaba. Okay. Sorry, Baba in, in, in a bit. I, okay. I think... At least for myself, right, if I look at it on a thesis perspective, I think the risk reward is really quite lopsided. Meaning, I agree. There I, is I very, agree. Yeah. There's very little risk for you to lose a lot more money yeah. compared to go the upside. Compared yeah. to a lot of all the US stocks that are now probably at all-time highs, um, I think the risk risk reward perspective doesn't really square away or isn't really ideal in, in that scenario. So yeah. yeah, that's just my perspective on it. Yep. Yeah, not okay. financial advice. Okay. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so who can, who can say I give financial advice? Financial advisors. Those that are licensed. Oh, like uh, uh, licensed? Yeah, licensed Okay, people. okay. okay. Right. Got it, got it. Uh, question. The, mm. For example, the if I I know I'm in the advertising space, for example. So like yes. you said, Big Tech is like very, very easy to me. I understand yes. the business. Um, and then also, last time I used to do like uh, direct to consumer um, companies. So mm. like s- selling direct to consumer like supplements or whatever so like I actually went to search for like the health companies and stuff like, any public companies doing for example beauty or makeup mm-hmm. or whatever it is just like mm-hmm. so those stuff adjacent markets like right. you're mentioning um, those are like more difficult to research and stuff but for people who are not really in I mean they are in a specific industry but because they are so siloed it's right. difficult to get exposure or understanding of other markets how would you suggest people do so? To be very honest right if you ask from this perspective if you are really not maybe you don't have the passion to invest or passion, passion to research all the different investment vehicles the most standard kind of advice is always to just go into an index but then it comes to the other trade off where oh I want high returns I don't want to index I, I don't want 7-8% I want yep. to quickly top out my money right yep. then um, I, I guess there's no free lunch you kind of need to do your homework to really put in the effort to, to, to look into how to what, what the specific companies because you yep. want a higher risk reward you yep. need to put in the effort to find it yep. So, um, if not, I think there's another way where you can look into um, the different ETFs that are more sector specific. Meaning right now, I think semiconductor is a very hot sector because of AI and all the yep. automation and uh, all the transition towards the new paradigm shift, right? Yep. So, if you have put in quite a 
big sum of money in the AI, eh, not AI, the Semicon ETF. I think that did quite well. So I guess that's also another way to kind of get specific exposure to a particular industry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, investing to micro caps and versus the, the large caps? Because the large caps get mm. massive liquidity, mm. right? Like 200 billion in a yes. day type. Uh, but also the micro caps can, can moon technically, yes. right? So what are your thoughts on uh, deploying I, in that way? I yeah. think you need a very deep level of research. Okay. Meaning you really... So, uh, okay, I have a friend that actually does micro cap investing. Uh, I wouldn't say a friend, like he's an acquaintance, so he's quite old, he's 40 plus. He actually, he invests in Hong Kong, China micro caps. So the level of research that he does, right, he flies over to Hong Kong to talk to, okay, and to look at the factory because there's a lot of scams out there. Okay. So he flies right. over to there, he look, he understands the processors, and then there are times that they are trading at like price to book of like 0.2, 0.3. Price to book meaning the number of assets that he has on the balance sheet, um, let's say it's $100 worth, it's trading at $20 today. And what's so, the average in that market? What, what do you mean? Uh, because if the, if the PV is 0.2, right. Uh, oh, the average of, average of, uh, uh, generally Hong Kong stocks all trade like that kind of industry. Um, no, they trade at below book, but it's closer to 0.7, 0.8. Okay. So it's buying it at 0.2. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's generally the, the, the gist of it. So if you really want to go into the micro cap space, I can only say proceed with caution and really know what you're investing in. And best is if you probably know the founder, you, you went, went yeah, down yeah. to do your recce and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. That, that gives you that edge in the market to really know what you're investing in. And guys, the market is just getting it all wrong. I, 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 I won't call it insider info, but you do have a I better talk to the guy. I literally talk, yeah. yeah, you have a better appreciation of the business okay. and, and how they are basically returning, share, returning capital or um, basically benefiting shareholders. Okay. So yeah. But he's doing it full time? Yeah, he's doing it for that. He's a full time investor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, for normal people, no. I would, if, if you really ask me, I, I, if you, you are my friend and you're asking me, like John, you're asking me I'm asking to you. go into micro caps. <laughs> um, you can play it with FU money, meaning okay. uh, money, yeah, you can lose. money you can lose. Okay. Uh, but I think in general, a general piece of advice or just generally, larger caps wouldn't... I, because, okay, from my own investing philosophy, right, I always like to look what's my downside. I, I, I don't like the idea of losing money. And if I can of hold course, it all the way... Yeah. Um, I, I think mid to even large caps has a better buffer for how you invest your money. Yep. So yeah, that's just my perspective. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I won't consider Palantir a micro cap, obviously. No. Obviously, yes. but yes. Um, when, when it first came out, technically, like nobody really understood the product, and mm. uh, I kind of treated it like a micro cap, but like it's like, what the heck is this company, right? right. Uh, and then doing some uh, research, for example, yes. a founders fund, uh, yes. Peter Thiel put in money. Um, it's a data analytics. A data analytics, and then also check customer reviews and stuff. Right. Uh, I was confident enough right. to put money in. Uh. Right. So, like, I mean, obviously, American side, very, very easy. Like, Chinese side, probably a bit uh, right. Right. more difficult to acquire the information. Yes. But even some American companies can be... Some, quite sus. Some quite sus. So, like, yeah. how, do, how do normal people... Actually, can I ask, before we go to the topic, right? Sure, can sure. I ask your, your, your... So, Palente, you held through, right? So, you did, held through. You did quite well. Do you download cost average now? Uh, yes. So, I, I think my... Uh, cost basis is 13 or 14. Okay, so you bought from what's your starting? I just started at 18. 18. So when, when it was going down. down, it went down. But the thing is, after you went 14, then it went down again. I was like, I got enough cash. Okay, <laughs> so how, how do you reinforce that, that, that thesis? Or what, what were you studying at that, at that point in time when the stock price kept going down? Uh, so, like I said, the, the founders fund thing, mm. uh, Alex Cup sometimes can be a bit retarded, uh, but like weird. I would use a, a bit weird, weird yeah, yeah. But I, I was not looking at the founder; right? I was looking at the, the product and the customer reviews. Okay, and that's the way important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and like you can put out marketing videos, right? Mm. But what is happening on the back end can be totally different. Mm. So I was, I was seeing that that side of things. Okay. And also, I know government revenue is like is very sticky. Very very sticky. Yes. I mean, it's not even sticky; it's like impossible to rip out. Basically. Mm. So like uh, the one I know is that even if they f up like massively. Like there's still gonna be a base layer of revenue coming in, right? Yeah. So like the stock can't completely tank up. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So um, on on the perspective, I actually do. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Sure. Uh, I actually do research. Uh, board of directors or like the people who are the founders of the company. That history lah. That history. Okay. Like, like who who are they? Like what they stand for and uh, like what they've done in the past. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. I mean, that's a uh, different ways of researching, and that's also one of the very important. Customer reviews and basically retention and how they are reacting to the different changes in real time. So that's on Palantir. Yep. So back to your question on... I, I, I wanted to ask this question because in order for you to test someone's conviction, right? Yep. It's only when the stock tanks, then yes. you know. Because everybody yes. says that yes. I have conviction, I have a long time horizon. Then when the stock tanks like 20-30%, everybody sells out. Yep. So that's something respectable and you deserve 
that kind of appreciation right now because I believe Palantir is now closer to 23, 24. So you close to double your money already. Um, I have a similar, um, I guess, experience on this kind of whole tanking thing yep. because I was in the part of the Meta fiasco. I don't know whether you follow Facebook. Uh, when, when the 300, yeah. it went to 90. And okay, then when, when, to when he was doing VR and then it yes, started. Yeah, everybody okay. just said that, oh, this. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg lost his way, it's, it's a crazy yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. So so that was, I had a similar experience okay. and back then when it was tanking, right? Yep. My friends also saying, you're crazy. You're, you're buying a lot of all this. Um, uh, Zuckerberg is basically just burning money and, and the whole company is becoming unprofitable. I think at one point in time, one quarter, um, user actually went down and yep. um, free cash flow evaporated. Mm. So that was the, when it was the most pessimistic yep. in hindsight. Yep. So I guess that's also my, my personal experience with the whole stock tanking. Yep. Yeah. So I think back to your question on, I think for US specifically, micro caps, how do you detect fraud? Was, was that the question? I think uh, if there's a, technically like a new company or, yeah, like, I would say detect fraud. How, how do you know they're legit? How do you know they're legit? If, if they're not uh, like aggressively on the PR front, right? Okay. Yeah. So, you're trying to find a, a outsized kind of opportunity la, where yeah. people is, you're, you're trying to dig, you're basically turning all the stones to see which one is, is left unturned, right? I, I'll give you another example of a, a positive stock pick, okay. like, like CrowdStrike. Okay. Okay. CrowdStrike. Okay. CrowdStrike yeah, is I, a cybersecurity. Cyber yeah. so cybersecurity is a, a, a new super important up, thing. Up, yes. Correct. Yeah, like uh, I work in a cybersecurity firm, so I know that the purchasing decision comes from like, um, that the CTO is going to buy the product, mm. right? But it, when they go to the CEO, they're going to justify why I bought this over this, mm. for example. Mm. And it's like, are you going to go with the market leader or are you going to go with, uh, with some, some known right, name, right. whatever, right? Mm. So it's got to be a very important decision. That's number one. Then number two is the customer testimonial. Uh, super positive. Like, right. like <laughs> beyond, beyond expectation sort of right. thing. So it's like very, very good side that sort of thing. But it's very hard to find companies like that. Okay. So like, if but, you don't have that, right, how, how are we going to research? But even CrowdStrike is not, CrowdStrike is not a micro, not micro, a micro, not micro cap. Yes. yes. So I, I believe what you're trying to ask really is more so those young and budding companies yes. that are already in the billions of market cap. So I believe CrowdStrike when it came out, they're already slightly over a few billion dollars. So micro caps are actually in the millions. Correct. So that's Correct. So how are we going <laughs> to... I, I, like I said, I, I would caution against going into the millions, the okay. hundreds of millions. Right? Okay. So if okay. You, you're talking about this kind of more younger ones like Palantir, um, CrowdStrike, yeah. the billions, right? Um, these are more considered, considered um, growth investing in the growth side of things yes. because you're trying to find the next 10x or 20x or, or whatever. Yep. So from a growth investing perspective, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I can basically share with you some, some things that I heard like, from, yep. from my growth investing friends. Yep. Uh, there are, they, they, they try to research it in more unconventional ways. So give you an example, I think Shopee, I'm not too sure whether you know C Limited. Like. Let's uh, yeah, not talk about course. the crash. Like. Let's talk okay. about when it was <laughs> rising up, right? Okay. Uh, customer reviews, um, looking at app store downloads, trying to track it every day. Um, looking at where Shopee is ranking in terms of uh, Shopee and Garena and um, Free Fire, all the apps that they do download. Those are a few of the very unconventional ways of looking at researching companies. Mm -hmm. Because you're basically trying to time before the general market consensus. Yep. People haven't catch on, they are looking at backward kind of review because they look at earnings and then this is what they did last quarter. Yep. But what you're trying to do is trying to front run them. So you can kind of think of it from the way where you, you need to get data points that are more front running in nature, meaning it's not reviewed or you can't really um, extrapolate from past data, but more front running. But truth be told, it's not my area of expertise. Mm. I can't really give you a set of guidelines, oh, hey, um, A to Z, you follow this metric and then you just go ahead with it. Yep. Um, you need to be more creative in terms of how you research these companies. That's, yep. that's basically my, my conclusion from how I, I, I talk to some of my friends in that space. I'm quite surprised you don't consider yourself a growth investor. I, I wouldn't. I actually am more in the value camp. Yeah. Right. I, I try to I try to look for mispricing opportunity where there's a lot of crazy uh, bad press or bad publications and yep. that's why the stock price just basically tank. Yep. I, I like that space because I like to buy when everybody's unhappy or, or fearful yeah. about it. So so tank when a random uh, incident but fundamental still there. Is yes. It? I, I wouldn't say it's random. Sometimes it might be it might be, okay, I'll give you another example. So Amazon also, so the share price tank because it was in a heavy kickback cycle. So people also saw that Andy, Jesse and, and before... Um, but but they have a the reputation left. of uh, that. So it's not, it's not right. like it's... But people didn't care. The stock price still tanked. I think yeah. it went from 180 to like less than, less than 80 bucks or something. Yeah. So it still tanked for 50%. Yep. So that's those kind of opportunities that I like to kind of try to uh, disrupt the market or say that, oh, you guys are wrong. And I, I think that there's an opportunity here. So that's, that's my... That's, a, I think, my style of how I look at investing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
what are the other stocks like outside of Baba? Because I can go to your channel to watch Baba. Right, right. <laughs> like, what, uh, for, for my own exposure? Yeah, yeah, since, since you're a value, what right. are the other value? My, my, my top few picks actually now is Baba, Tencent. So those two are in the Chinese tech space. Um, I do have a more speculative position, which is China banks. So I think, I, I'm not too sure oh, whether you follow Ever, Evergrande. Um, I can go on to my thesis later on, okay. um, on, on how I look Wait, at... are these literally your top three? Uh, if I'm not wrong, yes. China banks is... I, I, I buy it like an ETF, so I... Ah, okay, the top okay, few, okay, right, okay, I buy okay, 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 okay. something like Buffett's um, Japanese conglomerate bank. So okay. he doesn't know which one is going to do, do well. Okay. So he just bought like all five top Japanese trading houses. So that's the approach that I'm using with China banks as well. Okay. Then I have the big tech. La. But I bought them all more of in the 2022 bear market. So Facebook, Amazon, Google. I happen you bought it so late? I, I bought them quite late, yes. So then previously, what were you holding? Just cash? Eh? What, what do you mean by previously? Like previously, because you haven't deployed... Pre-2022? Yeah. Uh, I was in Chinese tech all the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So then, oh, of course, you, you have earned income and stuff. So that's when I started deploying to um, all this US tech when it was going down in the bear market. Okay. Yeah. Previously, I did hold... I mean, pre the Chinese tech crash, um, I was also in US big tech. La. I was in yeah. Apple. I think I had great time. I think Apple, I bought at like 100, 100 or something. Now it's like 190. But I, I did paper hands, meaning because I needed to raise money to go into Chinese tech. But Chinese tech has been continuously been in the bear market for three years now. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's okay. I guess in hindsight, it's not a very good decision. But yep. yeah, that's my, yep. I still have very high conviction in, in the tech space yep. or the Chinese tech space. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can talk about Baba a bit. Sure. Um, <laughs> Because I I am also on the mm. same boat as you. Mm. So like I I'm optimistic. I understand uh, e-commerce. I understand they have a hundred billion dollars on their balance sheet. This is not going to go anywhere. Right. Um, but also at the same time, how I feel is like I know you'll recover, right? It's just more like, uh, do I have enough? Not patience. Like, mm. would the money be better deployed elsewhere? Because like. For example, like Indonesia is a growing market, massive, right. 200 million, for example. Yes. But for example, in our lifetime, are we going to live long enough to be able to capitalize on that market? That, that's right. how I think about it. Right. It's not that I don't like China. I actually love China and I love Alibaba's business. If I am the my private shareholder, man, this company is amazing. Okay. Yeah. So, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because time value of money, right? So. Right. Okay. So I think we let, let's split up the two concepts, right? Um, one having. The, the, the expected returns that you want to achieve, yes. which in essence is called the hurdle rate, right? So it's basically your... Okay, there's a lot of jargons here, IRR hurdle rate. Long story short, to break down the concept, it's basically your expected returns because you have a retirement planning. You need X amount of percent to hit your retirement goal, which is a pot of goal or a pot of money that you need for retirement needs. Yep. So that's one part. The second part is the opportunity cost idea. Yep. So... Uh, the idea of opportunity cost, you have a $10 today, you want to eat something, you either buy a, a, a chicken chop or you buy some Vietnamese restaurant, something like that. So yep. what's your next best alternative? So I think, let, let's try to tackle this opportunity cost idea first. In order for you to know what's an opportunity cost of something, you need to know the, 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 the end results of both. Yep. Your two, two choices, decision A, decision B. So here's the issue of investing. You really don't know what's your other of decision B. So, so... I, I share with you an you example. You can backtrack. Yeah, yeah, you can backtrack, but yeah. um, at this point of time, when you're trying to make a decision, you can't have that two superior methodology saying that Alibaba will return you 10% and Amazon will return you 15%, for example. Yeah. Right so all, you can do, all you're doing here is you're doing educated guesses. So a lot of all this um, opportunity cost idea, right? To be honest now, if Alibaba triples, you get back all your money, maybe the performance is better than whatever that you hold for some time and it only goes up by 50%. Right? Actually, actually I'm down at 70. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I'm down quite a bit. So okay. I, don't, I don't think you'll ever, but yeah, continue. Right. So, so from that perspective, right, I mean, assuming now you have a fresh capital and you're trying to deploy to the markets. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So we, we look at it from a fresh capital perspective, um, going choice A and choice B, you really can't tell which is the better decision. So that's why I try to shift the focus more on what's your hurdle rate and by deploying fresh capital now into the market, into this particular counter or this particular investment thesis, would it yield that prospective or that, that hopeful amount of hurdle rate? So let's say your hurdle rate now is um, a general one for most people, they want 12% or 15%. It, because the market does 78%. So you try to increase it 12%, 15%. Oh, but who, 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 is, who is saying this 12%? Uh, I, never heard I think for active investors, um, that's generally the market consensus that we want. To them it's good, like 12% is mad. Yeah. So per annum, if you do compound it at 12%, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's quite a high, high amount of rate for people to hit. Because 
So you see, uh, a lot of people say I want to 2x, 3x my investment, 100% my investment, 200% my investment. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the ability for you to continuously, sustainably do it, I think that's the question. Right. So uh, in the long term horizon, if you can compound at 12, 15%, because Buffer did it at 19, you do it at 12, 15, you are a little bit less than the God level, but you're still beating the market by 50% in, in, in percentage terms. Yep. Yep. So, so that's, that's how I look at hurdle rates. Okay. So when you look at it, particular investment thesis and, and uh, businesses that you want to acquire, mm. you are trying to project out what they earn, their net income, blah, 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 and you discount it back and are they able to hit the 12, 15% mark? And today, at least how I see Baba, um, they are easily hitting the 12, 15% if they are able to return that, that, that internal rate of return for you. Okay. So that's just how I look at, look at how, I, how I look at things. Okay. And maybe a subtopic to this entire discussion where you named it about investing in Indonesia and stuff. This whole argument or this whole idea was, was created for China back in 2000. Yep. Right, so they say China is the next rising economy, it's going to take over the US. Yep, yep. And then look at it 20 years later, it tanked because of a lot of the geopolitical concern and, 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 and tech regulations. But, and but to be fair, only the capital markets tank. Like the actual economy... It's still quite strong, yeah, relatively. It's, it's like a billion people, it's still... Right. Yeah. yeah. So, stock market in, in a sense, because what we are trying to do now, we are investing in the capital markets. Yep. So if we go through that three, five year bear market, um, if we re happen to retire in that time frame, then too bad for us, la. we only can suck our thumb and oh, I guess that's, that's, that's how we, we, we look at it. Okay. But assuming, assuming so, um, I think the Indian market has did quite well as well. It 10x in the last 10 years as well, if you didn't follow. La. I yeah. didn't follow. The Nifty 50. <laughs> I'm not going to. Yeah, they 10x in the last 10 years. Okay. But the, if you account for exchange rate, meaning if you try to look at um, the Indian uh, currency with SGD, um, they, I think it doubled. So the 10x returns if you account for currency fluctuation is 5x. But 5x in 10 years, I think it's still respectable on the index. So yep, that's just yep, yep, it is. looking at looking at how, how how things are just to contextualize it for you. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, you since you are okay now I've identified I am actually a growth investor. Right. Yes. <laughs> I didn't you know, are a growth investor. I didn't even know what to call myself. Okay. Yeah, you uh, are a as investor. a value investor, right? Then um, why Chinese stocks or like why not? Like you are very concentrated in the Magnificent Seven, I'm guessing. And actually, I only have those three. Oh, you only Google, have those Meta three. And, uh, Google Meta and Google Meta and Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Since you you research so much on other things, right? Uh, has literally nobody else picked your interest? What do you mean by that? Uh, like, don't you see better opportunities elsewhere? Yeah, I do. I do actually. So there are a lot. Of, actually, there are a lot of exciting people do write in to me. So Palantir was also <laughs> one of the. They literally like yeah, write, they write in to me <laughs> okay. about Palantir and and some Chinese stocks, lah. So. Okay. I think at least to me, right, it really goes down to, or it boils down to your investment philosophy. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways to make a lot of money in the markets. Yep. Because, yeah, it's it's the point of the capital markets for people to make money. Yep. Um, but you kind of need to know the temperament of yourself and what's comfortable for yourself. So to me, I I, I look at everything in risk-reward perspective. So there's, there are some that really give you 10x kind of potential. But the risk is really VC style investing. Yep. Or 100 beggars, right? It's Correct. VC style investing. Correct. So you need to shoot your shots in maybe 20 companies and hope that one of them 100x. So from my perspective, I'm able, or at least how I look at it, I want to dial down a little bit on the reward. I don't need a 20%, 30% per annum return. But the risk that I kind of want to take, I will cap it. So that's yep. why I look at it from this perspective. Yep. Yeah. So that's how, I, that's how I look at my own investment. But whether... Is it tempting? Yeah, of course it's tempting. There's, there's a lot of people that sell a good story in the markets today. Because yeah. one of the main job of a CEO is to sell the story. Correct, correct. He needs to go to the capital markets to raise funds and to tell people that, hey, you give me your money now, I give you X amount of stocks and it's going to 10X in I don't know how long. No, it's because their bonus is based on the stock yes, price. correct. Yeah. Um, I think for Tesla specifically. <laughs> la, but uh, I think Tesla is the only one that has, been, has, has the CEO compensation being tagged to the stock price by such a close margin. Oh. I think for the rest, not so much actually, from any space of my, my body of research that I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do, do other asset class um, interest you outside equities? Uh, specifically, crypto? Uh, no, no. It, it can even be Forex. Like. Uh, for me, not, not so, because that has been where I, I'm passionate in studying businesses. I like to see how people scale and how mm. people build businesses, yep. do modeling and see that, hey, um, your model works and then um, you thought that there was an outsized opportunity and yeah, you double your capital, for example. So yep. that, that's my, my perspective on how I look at this. Okay. Um, 
crypto, I have my own uh, skepticism. Um, I, I do know that of friends that make quite a lot of money there, um, but that's not something that it's not sustainable. Interest interests me lah, and I, I can only put it that way. Okay. Can you define quite a lot of money? Uh, some people is relative, right? It's like it could be 10 mil, it could be right. It could so, be 100 x yeah. So, so for at least a trainer in, in my company now, I think he made more than four five mil mm. in, in crypto. Yeah. So okay. that's from 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 trading crypto lah. Oh no, I said like from what 400 k. You know what I mean? Like oh, like, his capital ah. Yeah. I, I think he put it was less than one mil. Oh yeah, it okay. was a few hundred thousand. Okay. If I'm not wrong. Okay. Yeah. So it's very quick money. Um, I just don't completely don't understand it. <laughs> like, like I, I cannot like. Oh, here's I, I a number. Here are the earnings, and then like this will go up. So this you are like, the you are the standard. You are the traditional equity investor. One business, uh, one intrinsic value, and you want to try to discount for something. Not really. I'm more like. No. Uh, is it? Uh, is this logically gonna go up? Okay. Like like I I, I know for a fact uh, more people are gonna use Google search than less people, right? Yes. It's like a thing that will not change. Yes. Like it's quite yeah. It's like a, this is a fact. This won't change. Mm. So I know that okay, very safe. Okay. But like a crypto, if like I don't understand what is the catalyst for Dogecoin. Right. <laughs> like what is gonna make this thing? The increase? community. That's what they will say. Right? The, the the catalyst or at least the, the main thesis for many of these crypto coins is more people, greater adoption. And then okay. everybody will push up the price. There's so many coins what is the yeah. yeah. I get what you mean. So I'm 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 in the camp as well, but I think at least from how I look at the whole space, there are utility to certain projects and, and, and I, I can see there is a use case in the future but maybe now because it's in such a nascent stage yeah uh, yeah but do they deserve as big a market cap as Peloton <laughs> like, you know what I mean like a 40-50 billion dollar coin shit coin is very funny then. yes okay I, I get what you mean actually I think I, I believe now the whole market cap of crypto in general it's 2-3 trillion so it's similar size to a Microsoft or an Apple mm. the entire crypto space yeah. I mean, Bitcoin holds majority of the. Yes, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so this. So you zero, no demo at all. No, at zero zero exposure. I I, I resisted the temptation because I think when it was rallying in twenty twenty one. Yeah. We were I think we were still in uni. Everyone, every Tom, Dick, and Harry around me, they yeah. were all having they were opening their crypto wallet and seeing how the price moved. Yeah, I didn't buy it at all. Yeah, I also didn't. I, buy I, it I all. zero for my I don't give a shit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I also didn't. I, I had a little bit of FOMO, but I resisted like, I didn't I didn't go into crypto at all. Okay. So yeah. I guess I'm still considered a virgin in, in that sense. <laughs> Maybe okay. next time, I think when, when you really see the use case and utility, yep. but I think it's not, not right for, for me at least. Uh. So that's a personal personal choice. Yeah, I mean, I would rather use WeChat Pay than, than Bitcoin transfer. But uh, it's so. trackable. It, it track, it, I'm not buying shady <laughs> stuff. Uh, okay. Are you buying <laughs> shady okay. stuff? Uh? I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Technically, on the blockchain, it's also all trackable. But Go ahead and track. I'm uh, not yeah. buying anything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so that's just my thoughts on crypto now. Okay. Uh, just now you introduced the concept of the 100x, right? Mm, so correct. you want to explain? Right. Yeah. So I think on in, in terms of the concept of 100 beggar, it's a it's a book, I think, by Chris Mayer. If I'm not wrong, I, I don't want to butcher his, okay. his name, but yeah, you can fact check me later. But um, I think for the 100 beggar concept, right, he has two two main concepts that he, two twin engine of growth. Okay. So one is in terms of multiple re-rating, and number two is, of course, of growth. So, multiple re-rating. Multiple re-rating meaning, okay, so let me go step by step. So, there are a few benchmarks that he looks into. Um, it's really a VC style approach. So, what he's talking you, the minimum, I think based on the research is the minimum, the quickest way for a stock to 100x in the US market is I believe five years, five or six years. Uh, I, I'm not too sure, is it Monster or some other, so you think about it, a beverage drink, yep. 100x of capital. But, I think just going through the checklist, right, there are a few key thoughts that you need to look out for. Number one, huge amount of tailwind and growth. Meaning correct, this company correct. has to be very nascent in order for you to hit the 100x. Yep. Number two, um, it cannot be priced very richly. So we talk about a lot of the companies that are priced like on a multiple re-rating, right? So some multiples like you look into it, price to earnings. But maybe some of these companies or young companies don't have an earnings. So you look at price to sales. So in terms of the market capitalization, you times the sales or the revenue figure times yep. the price. Yep. Uh, the, 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 P, the PS ratio, then you get the price of the company. Yep. So from that perspective, a 100 beggar means that you need these two, two, key, two key, I guess, characteristics. If it's able to 10x or 100x its revenue or earnings from this current state, that's a very big potential. Yep. And number two is from a PS ratio, last time maybe it's rated at two, three times price to sales. It goes up to suddenly 20 times, so that's 10x. So if oh, it that, 10x, that's what you mean re-rating? Yeah, re-rating. Okay. Okay. So 
if you can 10x your re-rating, mm. your, your, your multiple re-rating, yep. and you can 10x your revenue, 10 times 10, that's your 100 bagger. So that's basically, long story short, the multiple, the, the idea. 10x your revenue and, and 10x, 10x your rating. rating. Okay. That's how you get a 100 bagger, because okay. 10, 10, 10 times 10. Why, why would the market allow a 10x re-rating? Okay, so I think in general, most of the time it's misunderstood. So I think giving and using the example of, use, let's say Palantir. So Palantir now is trading at a price to sales of closer to 25 times, if I'm not wrong, uh, based on the current trading prices. Yep. So 25 times price to sales, back then don't forget, Palantir was at $6. So mm-hmm. the market yep. gave it a four times re-rating. Mm-hmm. So could it go become the 10x? I, I don't know, but maybe ah, okay, okay, you, you okay, get okay. what I mean. Okay, okay. So back then, um, growth was slowing down. Yep. I think um, the government revenue was also, because government revenue is also very cyclical. Mm-hmm. If they approve the budget, suddenly it goes up. Then it doesn't approve, mm-hmm. then it goes down. Yep, yep. Then um, I think growth of Palantir back then was also very low, suddenly very low. Um, they couldn't figure out the sales process. I mean, just one quarter. Uh, I think two quarters. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, the market is always very reactive because Let's not forget of the foundation of the stock market, right? It's an auction-based yep. marketplace. Yep. So if everybody take, lose, loses hope, the story is breaking down, yep. like Meta, like Palantir, like many of these big tech in 2022, then everybody will sell. So that's when you kind of get your opportunity yep. or get the opportune time to kind of get it at a low valuation. Sorry to cut you off. Sure. You know, the, you say everyone will sell, but, but then in my mind, it's like if I'm a, in working in a finance and I'm a hedge fund, for example, right. why would these finance guys sell. who have billions of capital on the line right. sell so easily. Right. I thought they, they are, their conviction them high, then they buy billions. Eh. Right. So I, I do have my own comments on this, right? Okay. So um, at least based on my, my understanding, right? You don't want to look stupid or you don't want to be the one, the sore thumbs sticking out. So if everybody's selling or like my colleague or my peer, everyone sell, then you don't yeah, sell you don't my sell. boss or us. Correct. Then, and okay. when you're underperforming, you need to, you need to talk, talk to your shareholders. You need oh, you to mean talk that to your LP or the, the yeah, partner. right, your, 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 your partners and whoever yeah, yeah, that yeah, are paying. Yeah, paying yeah, 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 yeah. So why are you underperforming while other people are? So actually, you, if you really think about it, right, the Wall Street game and the retail game is totally different. That's why we all have inherent advantages. But then basically selling you the idea that, hey, um, you guys probably don't know much, um, so you guys should better off, you are better off putting your money with me. And then when they underperform, everybody underperforms together because they don't want to... Uh, that's why you see a lot of famous investors, they really don't give a F. Mm. But on that back, or on, on, on that basis, or that, on that fundamentals, they have already a very strong track record. So mm. people like Buffett, Michael Fund. Murray, yes, Magellan Fan, Peter Lynch, um, all these people, they have a very strong track record. So people won't question them for yep. underperformance for one year or two years. Yep, yep. But for newer ones, for people that are running in the hundreds of millions of low billion dollar, they are very... The very reputationally yeah, aware. Correct, correct. So so they have to move around with the with the market. Yeah, and they always like to make short term maneuvers. They don't have that so called long term horizon and can hold this for five year, ten year, whatever. So it's different. It's totally different. We don't have to answer to anyone. Maybe as creators, we need to answer lah because a lot of people like to watch watch us uh, sure, and, sure. and they buy and they sure. lose money. Yeah. But I think for really retail investors that you're just running your own fund, you are having a six, seven figure portfolio, do whatever you think. You, you have a higher conviction in and do your research and, and, and carry on with your perspective. So I think in terms of if you, you can't really compare Wall Street on the same note as us. Yeah, so, so that's just my perspective. You're essentially saying fund managers are, are even more short-sighted or uh, they're not, <laughs> they're less long-term than actually, actually retail. Actually, not really. I think retail, right, um, as, as much as we like to think about we are all long-term investors, right? I would yeah. challenge everyone, for those of you who do pick your own stocks, right? Try to run, a, I think Excel has a formula. You can run what's the date that you start buying yeah. and then how much you buy and then what's the date that has passed. Okay. So try to see what stocks that you hold for more than three years, five years or even 10 years. Yep. Because to a lot of people, um, they like to cash out. They, I don't know, is it an itchy hand syndrome? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they get a 20 per 30% then they cash out. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so I, I have a lot of people, I, I did tell my circle of friends to buy a certain stock and then it appreciated a little bit. Uh, of course, not financial advice, but they appreciate a little bit and then, hey, 20%, buy uh, within a short span of time and then they faster sell out. So that's when, that's why you won't see that double, triple, quadruple bagger and then or 100 bagger. Yep, because yep. you really need to resist that temptation to not sell yeah, yeah. and for it to appreciate by such a large extent. So it's really a lot more of an art than a science yep. because there's a lot of human psychology, investor psychology, when people, emotions come into play, how do you conduct yourself? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's it. And a classic example, I have a friend that buys, bought into NVIDIA. I, I didn't buy, by the way, so kudos to that, that guy. 
he bought Nvidia, I think less than a hundred dollars. How much you put? Uh, he put in, I think 20, 30 k. Okay. So I think it eight x from there lah. So it became hundred k. From that perspective, Nvidia went up, went up and came down fifty percent ah for at least three times, if I'm not wrong. Yep. So you can yep. go back and backtrack. It's actually very volatile. Yeah. yeah. So it went up, came down fifty percent. You don't sell. Went up, go down fifty percent. You don't sell. Yeah. And now that next run up, that next leg up now at, at 800, I don't know, I forgot how much is it, like 500, 600 or something. Yep. In order for you to, you need to tie through that volatility in yep. order for you to experience that in beggar. Yeah, and, and also comes the point where how much you put in, is it life changing money? Correct. correct and then correct. If, if it's really life changing money, do you still need to hang on? And yeah, then yeah, if yeah. you hang on really, it's even more life changing. So I guess, <laughs> I guess it re, it's really how you, how you manage your portfolio. Yep. Yeah, portfolio allocation is also another. Another art altogether, or yeah. another body of study altogether. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Uh, I I learned from Adam like the mm. he does like short term options or something. Correct. Right? To when the market is consolidating or something. Correct. Like, yeah. Right. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, can like I, I don't do that because firstly I don't understand it. Mm. Um, do you do it? And also like could you explain it? Right. So actually I have been dabbling in options for quite some time. So what Adam primarily do is. Um, I hear it from the horse's mouth. Lah. So he said that if you, a lot of people like to short the market because they say that, oh, a recession is coming in. Like the they, they want the cheap trails. But he called it cheap trails for a reason. Mm-hmm. Because I think net net, he didn't really make much money from shorting the market. Okay. But rather than from buying, holding, and just long doing long term yeah. investing. Okay. So that's um, the idea of just short term or trying to short the market or going short. Yep. So back to the idea of trying to hedge your portfolio, right? Um, you kind of need to know what you're doing. but. I think what he's saying now mainly or what what looking at his actions and how he positioned his portfolio, right? So could you explain what why option option is a hedge? Okay, so what people generally do with hedging is so let's say I have a portfolio of stocks, a portfolio, mm-hmm. and I want to I, I I expect the market to go down. Mm-hmm. So what they generally do is they try to sell cover calls. So okay, to explain what cover calls are, um, a call option is basically you you want to get exposure to a stock, but then they don't want they don't want to have such a big cash outlay. So they don't want to spend, let's say you want to buy 100 stocks of Nvidia. Yep. Nvidia is $600, yep. you want to buy 100 stocks that's 60,000. 600, 6,000, 60,000, correct. So you don't want to shell out 60,000. So you buy, you use a call option instead. Um, but on the flip side, you can be selling call options, meaning you have 100 shares of Nvidia now, mm-hmm. and you want to sell a call option um, expiry at whatever date, and you want to sell your Nvidia at a particular strike price. I hope it's not too much jargon, but generally yeah, you're selling to the guy who wants to buy the, the, the buy the buy the, buy the buy the buy the call option. Buy so you're option. selling call yeah, option. Okay. The guy is buying the call option. Okay. Yeah. So the so guy is betting the share price goes up. Correct. You are betting that the share price stay below your strike price. Stay below my strike price. Correct. Okay. So I think what he generally says is by hedging your portfolio is because you don't expect the price to go higher than where it currently is. Mm-hmm. So maybe you sell a covered call at five or ten percent above your your current prices, and then you collect a premium on it. And then if the share price go down, then the, the option just expires worthless. Okay. So that's generally what he does. Um, looking at cover calls and looking at price action and the chart is overextended and blah, blah, blah. So that's a little bit more technical. Okay. But I think in terms of hedging wise, right, um, you kind of need to know what you're doing because he does a lot of, uh, you, you need to look at a lot of technical analysis and price action. Correct. Correct. So to me, um, I think for myself, I don't do cover calls. Uh, mostly I'm doing cash secure puts, meaning I'm selling puts. So it's, I'm supplementing a long strategy. Sorry, what I'm is going, selling puts? Okay. <laughs> right. So, okay. So in, in the options market, there are two, I think I'll just do a brief crash course. Da. In the options market, there are two types of options. One is a call option, one is a put option. So how I look at it is very simple. How I remember it is very simple. Call option means that you want things to go up. Put option means you want things to go down. So this is on the long side. So if you're on the short side, it's the reverse. So if you short a call, you want the prices to go down. If you short a put, you want prices to go up. So from my perspective, if you look at the put option universe, if you short a put, means that you want the prices to go up. So a cash secured put means that um, you have X amount of dollars, you are ready to buy the share, but you don't want to buy the share. So you sell a put first. If the prices, so you sell a put at let's say, um, let's, let's take Baba for example. Baba is at 80 today. So you sell a put at 70, means that if Baba goes down to below $70, you will have to take, you have to take the price at 70. Even though it goes at 60, you need to buy it at 70. So it's a contractual obligation to tell the people that I need to buy at 70. So if I keep selling cash secure put and the price don't keep down, you actually do collect a premium of a few dollars per share. Um, but you multiply by 100. Lah. So you just keep doing it, you just keep recycling because you sell it on a monthly or 45 days basis. 
So you just keep collecting premium. Then, of course, there are times where your expectations are miss. Then the share price really go down. Then all you have to do is you have to exercise the share, meaning you have to take, take over 100 shares of it. Okay. So um, how do you generally do it is, actually, if you do sell or put, um, it's a bullish strategy, meaning you expect the share price to go up. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to supplement your entire portfolio mm -hmm. um, um, in, in terms of how you look at it. Like. Can you actually lose money in that situation? If you already do have, you already do have the, okay, so it really depends on what's your motivation. So if your motivation is, I want to buy the shares in the mm -hmm. first place, yeah. but I just delay the buying, then you won't lose money because if you would have bought the shares at that, that price, uh, because you usually sell the strike at below the price itself. So you would have bought it at a cheaper price. So you technically won't lose money, but mm. if the share price goes a lot lower, then yeah, like, that's your misjudgment. Yeah. Meaning you would have lost money anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, that's just... Okay. Yeah. okay. So um, a, a lot of people like to duck the cash secure put strategy as free money. To me, I really do look at it um, from a perspective that it kind of is free money, yeah. but you kind of need to know what's your strategy going into it. Like, you you, need, you actually need to monitor the price. Yeah, you need to monitor the price. Which takes effort and time. <laughs> and you need to okay. monitor the company. Because sometimes company might, be, might have deterring fundamentals and that's why the share price keeps going down and down and down. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very thin line in, in, in cash to tell goods. So but, yeah. to answer your question on um, after going that crash course, to answer your question, I think generally now Adam does his cash to tell goods. So what he's trying to do is he's supplementing his returns. So to give you a perspective on what's the percentage return, I think cash secure output now he's targeting around 1 to 2% per month. 1 to 2% of what? Like the entire uh, portfolio? Of your capital, yeah. Oh, 1 to 2% uh, per month. So if incrementally, of course, let's not forget, um, there are months that you might not do well. So if you average it out, if you can do an additional 8 to 10% per year, additional uh, on top of all your long stocks and whatever, mm. I think that's, uh, those, that's quite a good... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, incremental returns for you lah, because yeah, it's yeah, yeah, theoretically yeah. free money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's that's how you look at it. So mostly he does cash account puts, but sometimes he do cover calls. But not so much as well, unless mm. it's very, very overextended and he wants to sell the position. Yeah. So uh, it's a whole... I would, I would encourage people to kind of look into it, look more into it, because now this is a very vanilla, simple way of looking at it. Yeah. But you kind of need to do more research in terms of the companies that you want to play with and how the options premium works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it feels uh, a little bit complicated. No, not only in a little bit complicated. If you're not in finance, um, to yes. even learn this thing is the learning curve is good. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Slightly steep. But like I said, like, if, if you are interested or if you really do have a passion in this, I think it's quite, it's quite fun. And you're playing the money game. To, la, to, 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 to be fair, if, if the portfolio is like four mil, and that one to two percent, it kind of makes sense. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, correct. But, but if you're like sub one million, it's, like, it's completely yeah. waste of time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but you need to kind of learn it, right? Because it's a skill set anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you're playing with a lot of money, like if you're going in the millions, right? You're going to magnify your losses. Yeah, you're going to magnify your losses. So in a way, um, it's a skill set that you want to kind of harness earlier in a way because when your portfolio is smaller, you can yeah. blow it. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend blowing it, but yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, can, yeah. you can blow it. Yeah. Okay. This kind of feels like this can be automated via yeah, Python bot or something. And then you just program a logic and then... I believe there's yeah. scripts involved as well. Um, but to me now... Uh, you like control? I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm doing it myself. Lah. I, I'm, I, I think in terms of the learnings wise, yeah. because in order for you to script it, um, the logic has to be dead. Because you need to script it into, correct, the, correct. into Python, right? Yeah. But if the logic, if, if the market is fluid and things are moving, you need to be very quick to, to kind of move together with it. Mm. But to me now... Um, my portfolio is quite small. I'm in the six figure, like just six figure, 100, 100 plus K. I'm doing 1% a year because I'm just trying to test out the theory. Yeah, I'm yeah, playing, yeah. I'm you're, playing you're around with. You're practicing. Yeah, I'm practi practicing yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's that's how I'm playing with options now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I realized that the, there's like a nuance that I learned. That mm. <laughs> when the market completely flipped from, from uh, growth to high interest rate environment, I was like, oh shit, why, what, the heck, what, what the heck is happening? Then I was like, yeah. oh, okay, PE matters now. Right. Guys, wh wh why didn't you tell me this? Right. Then I was right. like, you only learn stuff when you lose money, right? right. <laughs> yeah, but you also learn very fast when you lose yes. money. Um, this type of nuances in the market is like, I had, I had to lose money to learn it, which I feel is like, um, how do you learn these nuances without being in that position? Like, like I'm sure they are like tenets or yes. principles that you, here, here are the principles but then really when you start playing your own money, it's like, mm. yeah, but I guess my question is, yeah, how, how do normal people get to know these nuances? 
I think the, of course the caveat here is the fastest way to learn is of course to lose money. Yes. When you lose money already, you will have that real experience and it's deeply etched in the Correct. Mind. So Correct. That's, that's how you quickly learn. But uh, because you don't do it full time, yes. I can't really explain it or, or a lot of things that I discover myself. It's also because through hours of reading different books and looking at how people talk about it and also your own research and, and looking at it. This whole idea of PE compression and growth stocks becoming value Actually, everything goes in a cycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything is But a you, cycle. you don't know it because you are at that, point, you're in at that point in time. You're not even <laughs> looking at that. Then, all I can say is you only learn through experience. Yes. You have to look. It's a live experience. You yep. go through it and okay. then realize that, oh, um, P actually do matter or um, price to sales actually do matter and stuff like that. So for myself, how I understood it, um, it was of course through reading and um, through uni. They, they taught it through. Oh, oh they actually through, taught it? Yeah, they taught it through, okay, okay. through our degree. La. Okay. Yeah, so. Got that. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can't trust. So. <laughs> so I guess that's that's how. So, you yeah, the professor of, can say it, but when the, when you're really there, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. yeah. You, you you only learn it through through your own experience. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, because yeah. I, I give you another example, or I give you another co- another side of the coin. Even today, I tell you that it matters. When everybody's earning money and nobody cares about PE, you wouldn't believe me. No. So only when it crashes back yeah. in 2022, then you will realize that oh yeah, this theory actually makes sense. Yeah. So I guess it's. A, a, a lot of a lot a lot of facets yep. you, you need to your your theory is one part it grounds you in reality yes but then your life experience is another part and yeah. then when you see everybody making money you're kind of just oh yeah this guy is talking nonsense he doesn't know what he's talking about correct yeah so you wouldn't you probably wouldn't listen to him as well so back then I think when Cathy Woods was earning printing a lot of money and then you saw the chart that um, I think five year or ten year chart she was actually outperforming Buffer yep. everybody said that Buffer lost his way he doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> they said that yeah. he's washed out yeah, that's, yeah, that's washed funny out. correct so, so I guess and, but Berkshire, at the end of the day, it stood through the test of time and Berkshire is still standing strong. Yep. So, in a way, he was right. it really depends on how you want to look at, at, at what snapshot in time you are looking at it and how they are performing and what's their performance. So, I guess that's, <laughs> that's the general advice or, yeah. or, or how you look at things. But, but the thing is, like, my, my day job is not in finance, right? Mm. So, like, I, how would I even know when the rotation is happening? Because I know the fund managers, like, if I'm full-time finance guy, like, Sure, yeah, it's like you should uh, be my, 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 my colleagues are telling me, uh, my peers are telling me, I go drinking and then I hear stuff, right? Oh, yeah. guys, okay, we're rotating. Yeah. Then every, the billions of dollars is just suddenly. Rotate. Yeah, right. but like, if I'm not there and I don't get this info, then it's like. I would say that, okay, so it depends on back to your investment philosophy again. Yep. I think playing the rotating game is very tiring. It is. So it if, is. if you are really, from what I understand or from what I'm hearing on how you are conducting your own portfolio as well. If you're looking at the, the, the more mid-size, looking at growth investing, and you're really looking at 5x, 10x, right? You should stick to your I am okay with 4, 5. Yeah. Uh, no, no, 2, 3. <laughs> 2, 3. So if you're looking at 2, 3, right? Yeah. Then forget all this rotating thing. Look forget at, about study, your, study your conviction picks. Okay. Look and build a strong enough portfolio, a resilient enough portfolio. Okay. And you know, do your own thing, studying customer reviews, um, looking at the products, and asking people in the industry. And just, just focus your bets on it. You, mm. Valentia can go whatever, like five dollars, two dollars, whatever. Yep. If the company is still executing and it's still printing enough, enough businesses and, yep. and prospects moving forward, just hold it through. It will reach your ideal amount of hurdle rate in at the end of the day. Because you need to understand you're building a portfolio for yourself, yep. and you have you only you yourself know what's your objective and where you want to reach. So you do whatever you need to do. Mm. Yeah. So playing the rotating game is dangerous because. I think back in 2022, everybody said that recession was guaranteed. Sorry, I'm taking notes, continue. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's, 100%, it's 100% recession that's going to come in 2023. Okay. okay. But look what happened in 2023. Everybody broke. Every, everything broke all-time highs and we are, we are, we are going all-time highs again. Yep. Then, and if I'm not wrong, actually, the, there's a benchmark index for hedge funds. Most of them actually did un- underperform the index. Yeah. So the index was 20 plus percent. Everybody was below and some even went negative. Yep. Why? Yep. Because their expectations and their rotating they got screwed up, basically. Mm. They, they thought that the market is going to continue tanking, but it didn't. Yeah. So that's also the danger of, sure, if you rotate it correctly, then you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll come out on top. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like you should stick to your own game, know mm. what you're playing, mm. and just continue playing in that, in that lane of where, where, where you're playing at. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how I, I conduct myself as well, and, and how I play my portfolio. Okay. Yeah. How, how much like fresh capital do you normally deploy every year? I mean, as a percentage of your income or percentage of your... Whatever. Every year, like I'm, I'm guessing, there's fresh capital, right? Yeah, there. Are. Yeah. So, like, how much, how much do you sit cash and um, actually invest it? I mean, if, if, even if it's sitting in the brokerage account, right, it's considered cash, lah. So cash. Okay. Yeah. I actually don't like holding cash. You don't like holding cash. I don't like holding cash. Yeah, me too. I don't like holding cash. From from my. But also, like, I look at it and it's like, 
Okay, everything's all time high. Don't buy. Like, like in my brain, it's just don't buy. Don't buy. Okay. Don't buy. Don't buy. <laughs> emergency fund aside, please keep aside. Yeah, 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 for yeah, your yeah. businesses, for your own life, yeah, please yeah, keep yeah. your emergency fund aside. In terms of investing, right? Here's how I look at it. Um, it's a, it's not a mainstream way of looking at things, mm-hmm. but when you're young, when you're 20 plus, going 30s, sadly. Yep. If you project out your income or project out, uh, also depends on when you want to retire. But presumably, presumably that you are very passionate in what you do and you don't want, wish to retire. Yep. And you want to continue hustling, scaling, building your whatever, your career, your business, right? You still have a very long time horizon. So technically, you'll be perpetually underinvested. If you think about it, you will be perpetually, perpetually underinvested. underinvested. Why is that so? Uh, presuming that your business continue growing, your career will continue growing, mm. the amount of money they're going to come in later will be a lot higher than now. Whatever you're doing now will be a lot lower compared to next time. So if you think about it, when you are perpetually underinvested, what you want is to grab as much equity shares as possible at now. any point in time, any, any regardless. Point. Because if you really do your research and you're building or you are, you are funding your amount in, or at least you are buying the good businesses, mm-hmm. the value will always increase. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question on, oh, everything is at all-time high, why would I continue buying? Oh, no, no, I'll like, only buy when it, it like, dips it a while. It dips la. a while. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of retraces back. La. Yep, yep, yep. Actually, there's a, I, I, I also had that thought. So in order for me to disprove my thought, I need to go and research, right? So I went, I went through a research piece I, I can share. Um, I can, you, maybe you want to cite the link below in the show notes or something. There was this very interesting experiment that a fund manager did. So what he did was he tried to track two performance, um, the S&P performance mm. and the bond performance. Mm-hmm. So he, he programmed an algorithm or he programmed, he programmed a script la, saying that if uh, he do it on a monthly basis, so he will reallocate or reposition his portfolio every month. So at the start of the month, he will track, is the S&P 500 in all-time high? If it's an all-time high, 100% S&P 500. Following? So next month, if the S&P is not at all-time high, sell everything, convert it to bonds. Which sounds dumb in my brain. Yeah, which sounds dumb in your brain. Okay. But, if you, but he actually outperformed the index if yeah, he does he it. Out the performance. Yeah, the, the portfolio actually outperforms the index. Oh, so okay. what is the main takeaway from this research, right? Is we need to read that report for sure. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> we need to read that report. <laughs> yes. No, the, 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 main, the main takeaway from the research is there is momentum. And why he's doing that, right, is basically he's betting on momentum. He's doing some indicators on uh, the... SME and the moving averages and mm. stuff like that, right? So whenever it's at um, at all-time high, you just keep buying. The market will continue bringing you up to all different all-time highs. Yeah, and when the market doesn't go down, comes down again from all-time high, you straight away sell the bond. Yeah, okay. you sell away and then you buy, you bring the bond. Okay. Of course, that's not that's not an advice for people to do it, but there is a certain way of it's, it. It tries to break your perception. preconceived yeah, assumption yeah. that oh, yeah, at all-time yeah. high means that. Hey, um, you only can buy. You only buy when the, the market comes down. Okay. Because let's not forget, when you don't buy, it means that the money sits in cash. Correct. Yeah, you are not acquiring businesses. So goes back down to the opportunity the, the, cost. Yeah, goes back down to the underlying belief again is if you really believe that you are buying, you are, you are investing for the long term, you are really buying good businesses. You should be buying as and when, whenever you see opportunity, and you just deploy your capital when, okay. when you want to acquire as much shares as, as possible. Okay. Yeah. So that's my perspective. Okay. Um. The story or the research that I wanted to say was not so much of trying to tell you to do that, but more so um, to try to break your belief mm, that yeah, yeah, going all-time high means yeah, that yeah, you'll yeah, definitely yeah. retrace back down. Okay. Because okay. if you pull it out long enough, 20 years, at 5,000 points you think in the S&P is high enough, I can tell you in the next 30, 40 years, you'll see 10,000 10, points S&P. So you tell me, you want to buy at 5,000 or 4,009 or more cheaper, I want to buy at 4,007, does it really matter? It's going to go to 10,000. That's the preconceived notion that you okay. buy into an index. Okay. Yeah, so that's just... But only, only relevant for index and good businesses. La. Yeah, it goes with the correct. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even good businesses will turn into lousy businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, so if you are in the, in the business of trying to be stock, actively investing, meaning yeah, yeah, yeah. stock picking, right? You have to have a pulse of the market and pulse of the businesses that you follow. And if, if you really think about it, even lousy businesses like IBM or Nokia, not saying that they are trash, but... If you really do monitor are, them, no. sorry, IBM is is doing it's something. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's, it's coming back. It's coming they back. Try, they try. Yeah, they try. I respect. But in 2012, 2013, when the business start to deteriorate, right, the share price didn't just tank 70%. I I feel like now, in the last five years, right, we are in very interesting times. Mm-hmm. Like when the older folks, when I talk to my dad, because he has been investing for some time, yep. he didn't see people after earnings report can gap up 
30, 40 percent. Mm. Large caps, by the way, move up 10, 20, 30. I don't also, follow so, Netflix. You don't see this kind of thing Also, happening. the momentum is extremely, like, much more volatile than yeah. a, a yeah. lot, than 10, 20 years ago. 10, 20 years ago. This, okay. is, this is a thing. Okay. So, everybody is learning new things. Okay. Everybody in the finance world is learning new things. So, but back then, I think if you look at IBM or you look at some of these big companies, dinosaur, so-called dinosaur yep, companies, yep. when their earnings are slowly deteriorating, fundamentals are slowly deteriorating, and they're not growing top line anymore, yep. their, their earnings are going down, the share price actually didn't, like, come down to 30, 40, 50 percent. Yep. It just slowly goes down and it grinds down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, within five years, it loses, like, uh, 30, 40 percent. It slowly grinds down. Yep. So, we are really living in very interesting times. It's probably because the information is false, instant. Correct. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. That's, that's one, one potential hypothesis as well. Okay. So, but I only can say, if you try... Okay, we talked about uh, fresh capital deploying uh, mm. oh, uh, right, a percentage right. allocation. Right, right. Yep. Yeah, you're asking for myself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess for yourself and also advice. Advice on? Uh, like, how would you see best fit on... Oh, you say uh, we're being underinvested. Oh, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Un- because of the age, right, and the time horizon that you have, yep. you will probably be underinvested perpetually. Yep. And uh, assuming that your income grows and everything, you should be investing more and more over time. And mm. by the time you reach retirement age, you should have a sizable income. Correct. But at least for myself, you're asking me how much I put in. I think, uh, at least for now, I'm trying to invest 50% of whatever I take home. Now. 50% nice. of fresh capital Yes, take home. Of, of my take home lah. So yeah, take home express, your income, your side hustles, your whatever yep. businesses at the side. I try to do it 50%. But if you're running in the millions per month, then if you have a lot of money extra, then so be it lah. I, yeah. I would presume that you want to contribute more, but I'm an employee and I just do side hustles. So why, why 50%? 50%? Why 50%? Yeah, uh, why not like 70, right? Or why not 30? You can be more aggressive, you can be less. That's true. I think... I, I'm trying to, at least for me, uh, this is my life philosophy. I try to do a more balanced approach, meaning I don't want to, I don't, uh, if I really want to save like 80% of my income and just 80% and go go over, sure, but trying to spend more money on life and going uh, travel yeah. and stuff like that. So okay. 50% is at least my own benchmark or how I look at things. Yeah. So 50% is comfortable for me now. So that's why I do 50%. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. What does your dad, dad think of your job? <laughs> what does my dad think of my job? Yeah. Um, I think my dad actually is quite hands-off though. He doesn't really care. Okay. Are you only child? Takes, yeah, I'm, I'm the only child. Okay. My, my, dad's, my dad's okay. I think my mom's the one that is stepping in to think about... Uh, stepping about what? <laughs> to, to think about what? <laughs> because my, my, job is, my job is not as conventional. Correct. Because we all finish... Actually, your job is also not conventional. Running your own e-com business. For a normal degree graduate, it's quite weird. Do you agree? Like your circle of friends today, not talking about your business owner friends, but your school friends today, do they go into or step into this industry? No. No, right? I don't want them to send this industry. Why? Because they are smarter than me. I will push back on this. I, I can put this on the internet. No, I will, I, push, I, I will push back on this. I, my, my argument first. Okay, sure. So, so um, uh, generative AI, for example. Mm. Uh, so my sister's in the US, for example. Right? So I know that uh, tons of money, liquidity, and St- Stanford Berkeley guys, for example. Right. All of them are going to this. Uh, do I want to compete in the same space as a uh, Stanford PhD guy? No, absolutely not. I, 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 like, I would want to play in markets where it's, it's easier to compete. Um, if I work just as hard, I get 10 times more leverage, and I don't have to compete with guys just as smart as me. Or mm. I know that they are smarter than me because I sit in the same classrooms as them. So like like why uh, <laughs> I can work hard, I work lesser, and get more output, right? It's like, yeah, they don't really want to compete. Right. Yeah, I, I I do feel that the how do I put this? I do feel like it's an entirely different lifestyle. Running your own businesses, taking on the risk, and compared to a conventional job, having a steady paycheck. Yeah. So it's it's a lifestyle decision to me. At, at the core, it's a lifestyle decision first, and. To build it on, you say that they're smarter than you. This time I will push back on it. Because I feel like everybody has a very small niche area of their expertise or their passion, is that? So if you're really grinding and working hard at what you are really enjoying doing, uh, regardless of how smart gener- the general intelligence of the person is, he yep. can't overtake you because that's your area, the, the game that you're playing. Correct. But so, how I see is that if, if you put in the same hours and uh, experiences as me, okay. I know you can outform. Uh. But that's a hypothetical, That's right? a hypothetical. Right. Okay, but no, I, I think generally when I speak to John, I don't think it's a... Uh, I, I don't think it's... <laughs> I can benchmark it against... Because you are, we, are, we are both in... in same, in, around same uh, age. Yeah, same age. And, and I can benchmark it against my own 
friends and, and people that I hang out with, even in uni, right? Okay. If you're nowhere, like, it's not like a 1 to 10. Yeah, it's not a, a 1 to 100. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all com- comparable with different areas of strengths and Correct. our own, own Correct. area of expertise. Yeah. Although in business, if you are 1.5 times better, mm. uh, the winner takes all. It's like, it's like a Correct. winner takes all market. Right, so right. it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, so anyway, um, back to the question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, my dad's fine. My mom, I think, because of the conventional preconceived notion that, oh, you finish your degree, you should get a steady mm. job, you should get hey, a... Hey, Nanyang Business School. Yeah. <laughs> it's, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, I think she, she actually did say that she wanted me to go to the government sector because I want iron rice bowl and, and one okay. go, you yeah, won't yeah, lose your job sense, and, sense. and stuff. But I think right now, I'm just trying to do... I, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing in my day job. That's good. I, I get to enjoy the company of people and the people that I interact with and my job scope in general. Of course, 100% of things, I don't enjoy 100% of it because they're still lame stuff. But I can say that in general, I think two-thirds, 75%, 80% of it, I do enjoy my course of work. Yeah. And that said also, I, I can work on my own side things stuff because actually, I did, I did went to a bank before and, and stuff. And I think the regulations, or at least the atmosphere in Singapore is quite tight. And local are, or uh, MNC? Uh, local, local okay. bank. Yeah, so the, the atmosphere is quite tight and there's a lot of things that you can't really do. So you can't even trade your money. Yeah. You can't even like. It uh, depends on the function that you are in. Yeah. So if you are in a closer to the money or closer to the market's function, then you can't. If you are more back end, more away, I think it's still okay. Mm. Yeah, but uh, long story short, I think there's a restriction on freedom of speech. I guess if, if I put it that way. Sorry. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so I, I mean it's just your own personal thoughts because yeah, 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 yeah. I, I can understand from a business consideration perspective you are a representative of the. The, the company and then they don't want you going around to punish reputation so yeah, I guess yeah, that's, yeah. that's just how the business is built so yeah. in a way um, quite happy where, where I'm at now so yeah that's, that's just it okay how so my mum thinks will remain as how she thinks la. okay <laughs> yeah and she, no matter what she says you also probably won't do it <laughs> so no I guess difference. we are all in our uh, rebel stage yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay okay uh, okay um I am sure as uh, someone who puts their opinion out there, for example, has an audience as well, um, very knowledgeable of the markets because you do it every day. Um, is it difficult to start your own fund in Singapore? Uh, I've consulted or I've asked, I've asked a, a few friends in the industry before. So, sorry, can you give context on good friends? <laughs> okay, so, so because, okay, I think that's why I actually do encourage everyone to build a personal brand or build an online presence um, um, regardless of what's your intention of building it? Yeah. Because it serves as an online digital resume. So through the years, I think I've been doing it for two plus years. So there are people in the traditional finance space running their funds that reached out to me as well to talk, mm. to basically have a coffee chat. And, and I also just wanted to understand how things work because- Are they so around the same age? Or? No, 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 no. They're all uncles. So very, very old people. So I realized also that a lot of people that reach out to me are all uncles. So they're all uncles that- So uncles 40 plus or 50 plus? around that range, 40, 50 plus. Okay. Yeah. I have a theory. So I think, I think once you reach a certain level of success, right? Zero female? Uh, <laughs> zero. What zero. Do you mean by zero female? Uh, no, no, reach out, no, no, female, no, no female reach out to me. No, but you need to understand my, my audience pool is 94% male. Okay. Fine. Yeah, so eh, eh. a lot of large numbers. But those people that reached out to me, we often have coffee chats and whatnot, right? Um, some of them are in the fund management industry. So I, I went to ask around, um, running a micro fund, meaning 10 to 50 M or 10 to 100 M, that range, they're they considered micro fund because you can kind of bootstrap, ask a few friends and then invest together. Um, those, I think the disclosures and the fund, it's not too hard. But if you want to go into a big one, um, I think the fundraising, that's one of the hard parts. And there's a lot of hurdles to jump through because Singapore is not necessarily a very <laughs> conducive place for you to run a fund. Are you sure? So from what I heard, really? Family offices are different. If oh, you want to okay. run a like fun fun, meaning you want to get funds in from everywhere, yeah. Uh, the disclosures or it, it's a little bit harder if you go to. If I'm not wrong, you go to the US, it's easier. You're saying the disclosure has to be hundred percent, or what? Like has to be hundred percent. Like like what what what? Uh, I thought they, they would, yeah. They didn't really go into the details, but for from from what I understand uh, um, I I met two two of two different leaks. One is a micro fund, meaning in the ten to fifty m range and one is in the, the, the bigger, the, the 100M and above range. So from what I understand, if you want to 
I, I, I consider before like fund management should be your end goal. Like you have to prove mm-hmm. a track record, yeah, like yeah. build a 10, 15 year track record and then go into fund management. Yeah. But then I've come to realize that um, talking and expressing my opinion and shit talk on the internet might be a more fun thing for me. You're not shit talking anybody personally. Right? Yeah, uh, but I'm basically just, you can express your opinion freely. Yeah. Because I think when you go to that level, you wouldn't, there is a... Continue this one. Yeah. There is a... There is a certain level of code of conduct, I guess. Yeah, so... I find this sherry... Yeah. But, but, but and you wouldn't be sharing your opinion, really. Because if you really do have a... A, a very interesting... Thing that you strategy. think... Yeah, strategy or what. You wouldn't be sharing it publicly. But Bill Edmund goes on CNBC and just talks shit But he doesn't... <laughs> Bill Edmund is a special case, lah. I mean, even when, when you reach that kind of level of success, right? Like even um, Buffett and Munger, they also talk shit. They don't care. Like when Munger, before he, he passed on, right? Um, he also talks shit. He just say that crypto is like red poison spread. Doesn't give a F about everybody. But that's after a certain level of success. But when you are just starting out, when you're just a budding fund manager, yeah, yeah. Um, you wouldn't be doing that kind of things. And you'll be very restricted by, I guess, the regulations in Singapore. I think the bigger, the bigger killer in Singapore's fund management space is the regulations in general. Yeah, because we do have a very tight control here. Okay. Um, MAS in general. T- tight control meaning if you are if you are managing director or something, you cannot be public facing and give opinion or Not so. I the, think the, inve- the investors giving you money will feel a certain way. Um I think I think in a way for, for the scrutiny part it's more of regulations and compliance sick compared to other counterparts in, in the world. But um, if you are talking about like setting up fund fund officers and family officers, right? Everybody comes over here because there's a lot of tax breaks and tax incentives. That's all the rich people, and yeah. there's stability here. Yeah. That's why they park their money here. Yeah. But not so much. They're not here to try to find the next Buffett or something because all the good ones go into go into the US and, and try to fight it out. Like yeah. So that's how I look at it. Mm. At least from my very limited knowledge in this. So I don't space. understand what you mean by disclosure, though. Mm. Like, 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 how would... Okay, let's say, uh, let's say you're 50 mil right now. Okay. How would uh, being open about your opinion affect anything? You're 50 mil, it's like, it's nothing. It's like, you're not going to move the markets. Yeah. So, so, so you mean you're running the 15 mil fund? 50. 50, 50 mil, mil fund. fund. Correct. Yeah, and like, you have pulled the capital already. Like, the uh, capital inflow is not, not the problem. Okay. Uh, and then you... you, like, you co- then you want, to be, you want to be very public with your opinion and... and just I mean, you, you already are, right? Right. So like, what what is the issue? I don't get it. Actually, that's a good question. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll check in and I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, call, but, call your but uncle. It, it, it's quite interesting, right? Like yeah. you don't see people that are very prominent in the Singapore fund management space being very vocal about or having a public presence because they don't get invited on CNBC. <laughs> They're not gonna call they CNBC. Do, Actually, they do. They do. Oh, really? There's a recent there's a recent fund that crashed and closed down. He went to CNBC before. So he, he was long China and I think he was on some leverage play and he long he, he long China and he shot Japan yeah. and his fund got destroyed like in 2023, 2024 and he had to close down oh. and he was on CNBC before. Oh. But, but, but they, they, do, they yeah. do, they do. But if you, if you close down your fund, you generally don't publicize it, right? Yeah, they don't publicize it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So but, but back then he was doing quite well, so he was on CNBC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you can be the first one. <laughs> That's interesting. It's basically so, what yours. So, yeah. so then comes the question on what, because I think fund management is a different ball game altogether. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's a different ball game altogether. You have to, you, you do quarterly, you do uh, yearly updates, and you have to tell people that yeah, yeah. why I outperform the market or why I underperform the market, and you get the pressure. And usually, like I said, because it's auction based, when people, when your fund is doing well, people pump a lot of money. Pump, in. Yeah. And then when your fund doesn't do well, everybody, by right, they're supposed to put more money in, but they leave the fund. Yeah. So then. It's a different way of trying to appease a different stakeholder game. And yeah. yeah, different game altogether. Yeah. yeah, so at least for now, in my current stage of life, I- I'm still focusing more on trying to hone the skill set. Of course, of course. To understand of course, better yeah. the markets. Yeah. 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 yeah, so that's it. Yeah, because what I'm thinking is that, like, because you're public facing already, the people mm. you know, the connections you know, uh, if you pull the capital, for example, uh, the reason why they know you in the first place is because you put yourself out there. So, like, right? right? So it, it, it's not a matter of. Um, uh, being public your, about your opinion is that the, the capital that you put the reason why they gave you capital in the first place is because you put yourself out there mm. so like it wouldn't have been a conflict of interest or wouldn't have been sensitive to them yeah 
That's how I see it. Uh. That's true. Yep. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I mean, like, like me, Kevin, right? E ETF. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, right? so you're, you're pulling base. Yeah. In an ETF, I think it's different also. Starting an ETF, running a private fund, going into family office, I think all those are different pathways to do. They're all called managing money, yep. but they all have very different ways of doing it. Yep. Yeah, so uh, on ETFs, I don't know. Okay. I don't know much about it. But in fund management, maybe I'll ask them, like, what specifically the MSA or what specifically is the regulation that why are you not public of your opinion? Yeah. Or why do you not want to be more front-facing? Because, like you said, you build goodwill, Correct. you get to pull in more funds, and if people trust you more, then you get more inflows, yep. in a way. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But um, one thing I don't really like, at least in the fund management space, is they, they take in a lot of fees. So if you do outperform... so what if you mean? Like, you, you, you have to make money. Eh? You, have, you have to operate operating expense. Yeah, you, you do have, yeah. but so. it will eat to your returns. So if you do a comparison, I, I actually did ask Adam before why he doesn't want to run, run his own fund. I'm sure people are going to... Yeah, like, like, hey, hey, yeah, here's, yeah, money, yeah, here's my money, man. Here's my money. So he did talk about the inherent disadvantages of being in fund management, which is being very short-term focused because you have to appease shareholders or appease people. And taking a fee, right? So for example, today, he sells you a course on how to do it, do your own investment for 2000 compared to you putting in, let's say, a meal with him. And every year, he takes out 20k because by default, 2% or 1.5%, 2%, that's the charges they do on an ongoing basis. So I guess that's really how you position and how you look at how you look at um, running businesses and how you want to profit. Not There's it. still that burden of like, hey, why are you taking my, my 2%? Yeah, 2%, correct. And even though, yeah. and, and the funny thing is even you, so for example, the fund that I was talking about, I think he actually did outperform for quite some time. And then when he crashes, crashes and burns for like one or two years, and then everybody outflow, and then he realized that it's not viable, there's business mm. continuity risk, he decided to close down. Okay. So, unless you can reach the god tier level like Buffett, like, regardless of whether he underperforms, people still, here's my money, because they trust in the brand, like he believes in the value investing philosophy. If not, I think it's really a very hard, hard, hard time to manage a lot of the stakeholders and the game itself. Or you Michael Burry and stop the outflow. Huh? They legally can, cannot outflow. <laughs> the, the one, I, I don't, I, I'm not too sure about the legally cannot outflow. Oh, okay. I think they can impose a penalty for you to not yeah, 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 yeah. this incentivize, <laughs> but you can still pull out your money because it's your money at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How, how do you spend your time? Uh, like uh, work day? What, what exactly are you working on? So, you're speaking in my day job or in day my job. free time? Day job. So, in my day job, um, generally, because I'm a content specialist, yep. so, um, unless there are any priority, let, let's talk about just a normal day in the life, like no urgent priorities or whatnot. Um, of course, I have to do market updates. I think like any Wall Street people, any people working in finance, you always do market updates. So you spend one hour. Traditional people, old uncles like to split the newspaper. Ah, um, newer yeah, kids yeah. like to go into YouTube, CNBC, you tune in Wall Street Journal and whatnot. So I think I spend the first, um, I guess, one, two hours of the time trying to catch up with the markets. If, especially now in the earnings season, you spend more time looking at earnings report. If not, you just look at general market consensus. Like, if there's an important Fed meeting or whatever, you try to keep in tune with the market. So, you don't have to look at every single things, but mm. you just generally know the pulse of the market. And then, of course, they always like to send this kind of meeting briefing minutes and whatnot. You just glance through. That's, that's how I generally form the base foundation. Then after that, um, uh, I spend another bulk of my time. There are generally ongoing projects that I need to do. So we want to launch an interesting report or we want to look into a specific things. So I, maybe I can hint to ah, you. Deliverables, basically. Yeah, the deliverables. Okay, okay. So okay. I spend a large time trying to do research and try to find different ways. Because I feel like a lot of knowledge that are out there in general, um, they are very plain vanilla. So in order for you to stand out in the marketplace, it needs to be different. It needs yeah. to wow people. It, it needs to, 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 to wow people, factor. Yeah. Correct. So the X factor is basically my main scope of research. I need to try to find ways to uh, maybe even portray certain data or certain um, yeah, research in, a, in, in a different way, like, yeah, in an interesting way. So that's the second part. And of course, the last part is keeping up with my own uh, portfolio investments because um, Adam himself, he runs a portfolio of stocks. So we have to keep a close eye on that portfolio of stocks. Oh, really? Yeah. So, oh, okay. so I mean, I'll give you an example of one recent one. So I, I'm not too sure whether you follow OpenAI. OpenAI has recently released uh, this Sora. Sora, correct. So this... And after that release on the market itself on Friday, Microsoft. Uh, not Microsoft. Sorry, not Microsoft. Adobe went down seven percent. So Adobe is a 
it's a it's a portfolio. It's I a don't portfolio like of stocks. Just FYI. Okay. So I but, can explain to you why at lunch, but never mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but Adobe is one of the one of the portfolio of stocks. Okay. So we need to assess or how how serious the threat is, and really understand what's the core fundamentals of this Sora. So how do they? Because okay, so the threat is everything. Let me just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> let me just let me just rent a little on, okay. on Sora or, okay. or how I look at Adobe. So. If you look at if you really look at traditional graphic design, right? They do graphic designing on a layered basis. Mm -hmm. So they try to they, they they put in a base layer of maybe the background and then they superimpose the human and then they do photo editing and then so that's why it's a very layered approach. And if you don't like a specific thing, you can just remove the layer. So the, the, that's the that's the approach of graphical design and professionals in their space. But if you really look at Sora, from what I understand, if you if you try to give a new prompt. Even though, let's say, they, they try to generate a base image first, and then you give them a new prompt and to try to retain all the image and try to put a new prompt, maybe I want a bird flying in. Actually, the whole image will change because they don't do in yeah, this approach. Yeah, it's a did. different approach. Correct. Correct. So then they, they basically try to do a lot of machine learning and try to learn the logic or theory of physics, and then they try to come up with some, some visuals about it. So then now, I think in terms of the implementation, there's still a certain hurdle for it to reach to where um, Professionals or people in the space are expecting it to be, but for now I, I I'm still optimistic. I, actually, I do want it to be, even though it's a very small percentage. I bought in at quite the time when they were tanking, but now I, I haven't been adding per se. But yeah, I'm still trying to monitor the thread on how real or, or try to extrapolate and triangulate all the different data points from the experts on how Sora is a thread. So I guess that's one of the ways you can say that what's my job scope? I'm supposed to constantly monitor different mm -hmm. companies in the portfolio yeah, yeah, yeah. there. Because we do have quite a lot of people in our community that do also buy in. La. Yeah, yeah. So we need to okay. Okay, we need okay. to be at our A game la, essentially. Yeah. Okay. So that's 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 how I look at things. So. Yeah, but you say if, if a lot of information is vanilla, right? Uh what were you were you actually talk to people or like just pure see a computer and research? La? What what do you mean by that? Like some people would actively go and try to find uh Someone in a, uh, not, not someone in Adobe, right. but someone okay. in graphic yes. design. Someone yes, yes, yeah. correct. So that's, that's um, at least what we're supposed to do. Like, I, mean, I mean, in the in the general scope of things, we're trying to... That time, I think Meta was one. Meta yeah. that went down quite a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a different atmosphere now. Everybody happy that Meta went up. <laughs> but that, back then, everybody was really afraid that it was yeah. a going concern. Nobody uses WhatsApp, Facebook and whatnot. So we will want to talk to more um, the people working there. Correct. And maybe also just to share something I, I, heard, from, I heard from a friend's friend. So Meta's recent blowout earnings. I don't know whether you follow Meta. I I do. Yeah. So one of the recent, most of the one of the recent blowout earnings, in the earnings report, they said that one of the biggest revenue contributor was the Chinese players. Yep. So that's the disclosure. Timo. Yeah. So Timo and I believe one more. I need to go and check my it's phone. It's been uh, in no, no, not um. Shin. And Timo is yeah. Timo and Shin. Yep. So you you kind of need to. Um, I, I guess from an investor vanilla perspective, it's like, okay, that's the perspective, correct. Okay. Yeah, so okay, for okay. now, now this is, I, I, I won't consider this insider info, but you are trying to gain a better appreciation of how things yeah, are playing yeah, out and try to project forward. Yeah, so yeah. some of these things, we try to keep it in our community. Lah. Like we, 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 we try mm. to talk to people and then, yeah, I guess, I guess to try to value add in a yep. way different yep. from how other people are doing it. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. you knowing Timo and Shin is probably because you're in the advertising space. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so those that are not, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those outside, we don't know. Yeah, we just that, that's oh, Chinese player. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So we we need to go and, in a way, try to ex establish that. Okay. So now Timo and Shin, how is it? Is it possible for them to continuously bomb money and, and spend yes. spend like a blizzard? Yes. Just yeah, FYI. So so we need to <laughs> we need to continue establishing yeah, 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 and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. extrapolate out. Yeah, okay. So that's that's how it works. Uh. Okay. Yeah. I I won't uh, delve on the uh, meta top topic. Just mm. letting you know. But uh, the biggest sin that Zuckerberg did, is to give a dividend. That's the biggest a, it's a massive We can talk about it later. A massive yeah. yeah. okay. 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 I'm, I'm coming to the end by the way, so don't okay. worry. Okay. Um, what, uh, what, what are specifically your skill sets? So my, my question is that, um, is it like Excel? You know, like financial modeling, mm. time value of money, uh, stuff like that. Um, Google search is a, is a right, skill set. Right. Um, what, what would you say, if people want to, I won't say get to your level, get to 50% of what you are, right? Um, how do people get into this and uh, also, like, what tools, what softwares do you generally use? Mm. Would you advise people? Yep. Actually, to be very honest, I don't think I have a... I'm not a very specialized guy. So, yep. Yep. even if you want to compare me, like, my Excel skills compared to Wall Street, that I confirm of, I haven't been. Of course. To me, right, it, it's quite interesting. I'm a... I, I, 
I probably want to learn. The prerequisite is probably a very curious mind. I like to learn a lot of things. Okay, I mean, me too. But uh, it's a given. <laughs> like, right. like, like, if you're not even curious, right, you won't be watching this at right. like hour one point right. five. So, right. Yeah. So, how how to? Of course, the things, the software that I use are company provided. I, we we use a lot of AI tool, AI ticker chat. Um, Can you give an example? But like, uh, we because. But they subscribe to quite expensive though. Like so, for it's example, okay. it's okay. It's <laughs> okay. Just okay. So I think a yearly subscription on 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 S and P Global is around 20, 30 k. S and so, P Global. Yeah, okay. S, S, S and P Global. What, what is that? Um, it's basically a software where they they populate. You can they allow you for a plugin to put mm. into Excel to do a lot of population and to do a lot of projection. It's basically ease of use. You can do it yourself physically laboriously, but it's a waste of time. So on a company level, we have a lot of all this software like Guru Focus, Warning Star. We get a lot of analyst reports from very different various sources. And all this needs to be bought. It's not free of charge. So they pay wallet and then we buy and then, I guess in a way, uh, you need to have a curious mind, you need to be skeptical. Because you have a lot of information out there right now and only you have the critical skill set to distill information that are important and people that are smoking you. Yep. A lot of all these sell side analysts, meaning those people that are trying to sell you a uh, a uh, company, yeah, yeah. yeah, try try to sell you the idea that this is a good stock. Um, they will increase a lot of fluff and and a lot of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. So what you need to do is really to cut through the nonsense and to look at what what matters and what doesn't matter. And in a way, if you look at software and things, we, we buy a, the company buys a lot of things. It's not my money anyway. And my my job here is to really filter and synthesize because what we are offering is a service straight to the consumer. Yeah. So. We are not expecting them to go through all this nonsense, so we need to filter and I'm the, in a way, the filter paper. Yeah, if, yeah, if, yeah, you, yeah. Talk, if you really think about you, it. You're the equity analyst and yeah, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. the fund. Yeah, the like, filter paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, okay. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, hard, hard skill. Hard skill. Yeah. And the curious mind is like, mm. you, you gotta be a curious dude. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, to be very honest, right, on, on a hard skill basis, what analysts do is actually, we basically just do Excel and, and, and research though. Yeah, it, the, the, fair, softer, fair. the softer way, the softer way or the softer advantage that you have or the edge is, is really your ability to look through the business and whether this business is, is uh, as presumably is a long-term investing. Yep. It's not, because if you go, go down the routes, right, there are many different ways of doing, playing this investing or capital game. So there are people that are short -term, more short-term in nature, meaning they're trying to identify the mispricing or the expectations. Meaning people don't expect this to happen. When it happens, there's a huge repricing. And yep. then they go out after 20, 30%. And then there are the longer term investor, which I, I think I am. Um, we look or we focus more on how the business runs, what's the natural economics of the business and how are they supposed to print more money and to benefit shareholders. Yep. So in a way, a deeper understanding of the, the, the business would be more important than, than one, two quarters. Like you said, you, when we were smirking at, oh, it's just one, two quarters. That's from a long-term investor perspective. Yeah. People <laughs> play on the quarters. Because uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they have to go to work every day and yeah. in their mind, it's just, this is the only thing that matters. Yeah. They play on the quarters. So okay. it's a different, it's a totally different game. So it's a big game with many sub-games. And for myself, I... Is the game not worth playing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hard skill-wise, I actually, I don't think it's too demanding. Knowing accounting, right, you don't need to know huge, like to the T on how accountants prepare or how auditors check their thing. To me now, um, I, I do a very interesting resource that you all should look, um, Damodaran. So Aswath Damodaran is a Dean, Dean, yeah. dean of... Um, he teach valuation classes in NYU, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, I watch. Uh, yeah. I watch so yeah. you can just check out his one of his playlists, right? He will teach you A to Z, yep, but yep. you need to contribute or you need to commit, I think, 15 hours, if I'm not wrong, for, yep. That, yep. for that thing. Might be technical, um, but recently, if you just want to know modeling or you want to know um, how to calculate intrinsic value, he released a most recent video. It's around one hour. Highly recommended. For a basic, I think you can you can pick it up. One hour only. You just need one hour of a commitment. And yep. you can probably apply that Excel formula to whatever that all the type of companies out there. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's I guess the most basic Excel skills that you should have. Okay. When you want to talk about looking into specific companies. Okay. Yeah. Second last question. Mm. Uh do you know who most uh is it most same <laughs> Shit, I can't remember his name. He's like a He's like the alternative, he's the Indian alternative to, um, uh, to Buffett. I think I saw, he, he did, I, I think I saw him on Twitter before, but I also forgot his name. It's like most, some, yeah, he, yeah. he's actually heavy in Tencent and, yeah, heavy in Tencent, something like that. I forgot what he's called. I don't even know, yeah, but he's, he's Indian, I remember he gave a lecture at, 
Okay, never mind. Monish <laughs> Pabrai. Yes! Monish Pabrai. Mo- yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, no. Then we are talking about different people. Oh, I was different. talking about an in- real Indian Indian investor. He's not Indian, man. Eh? He is Indian, Indian, but he's based in the US. Yeah, 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 yeah. US. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the Indian Indian. Oh, okay. So, the Indian dude make a lot of money in the Indian market. It's incredible. That's the Indian <laughs> okay. buffer. Who is this guy? Uh, uh, I can... I, I forgot that. I also forget. Yeah, okay, okay. A, yeah okay. but Monish Pabrai. Yes. Monish, right, yeah. Yes. Uh, do, do you know of him? Like, what, what's what's his deal? Like, who, who is like, why is he famous? I don't get it. Why is he famous? Yeah. I believe his backstory came from he turned one million into thirteen million. Like, he thirteen x is his his fun in a very short period of time. Oh, okay. Like, people talk about um, trying to ten x in maybe let's say seven years, ten years. Right? I think he did it in less than that. So, yeah. he was managing family funds and then one mil to thirteen mil, and then after that he spent money. He went to a charity dinner yeah. with I think Guy Spear. Both of them met Buffett. Who's Guy Spear? Um, also another fund manager. Okay. He runs Aquamarine Capital. Okay. So both of them paid for, I, I think, I forgot how much was it to have a buff. Access. I don't know I don't know if you know, Buffett runs a charity dinner every year. Oh. So you need to pay to have lunch okay. or dinner with him. Okay. And then they met Buffett. And then after meeting Buffett, Buffett introduced Munger to them. So that's kind of how they got up to fame. Lah, meaning oh, right, they are in the right sphere, okay. right, right sphere of influence. Okay. Yeah, so that's him. I think to, to him, He's a very good lecturer. So there are, there are two different groups of people. There are very strong investors, very smart investors, but then they suck at they, they suck at delivering value. Meaning they don't they're good at they good at, they're good in their head, but they can't really deliver it because mm, they're they just so smart. Yeah, they can't communicate it well. Okay. And then there are types that they are good they are good teachers and also good um, investors. So in a way, Monish kind of he gives a lot of lectures. He's also very open to his time. Meaning he goes to a lot of university lectures. And then he, he record it down and then he just uploads, uploads it to YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's, I guess that's how you learn. But personally, I don't really follow him to the T because yeah, I don't if, so. I don't. if you follow him in his, I think, um, what's that called? Data Roma. He's recently been very into steel or iron or Sorry, coal. Data Roma? Coal. Da- data Roma is a website that you track the 13 year filings of all the oh, okay. smart investors. Okay. So, he found, and then I think he's very big into some coal companies, which is a commodity company. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not really a compounder that he yeah, always yeah. talks about that uh, will compound your money. So, mm. uh, it's it's a it's a reversion bet, to be honest. So sometimes they, they like to say the the young people follow the rules, but the old people knows the exception. So maybe to him, he's really betting on the very big reversion for coal, and he might have better insights into the coal market yeah, and yeah, how yeah. they are able to play it. So that's why he's saying it. Not necessarily a compounding compounding machine that he generally talks about. So yeah, that's that's my that's my thoughts about Monish and my understanding of him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Sure. Uh, like you said, talk, talk about the coal markets, like commodity markets mm. and stuff, right? Mm. Um, as a growth investor or whatever, like a young person, like we don't understand these industries because we, we, we don't have like... Yeah. Then don't touch. Exactly, don't touch, right? But the thing is also like, then why why do people hold these companies if if like dividend is not great and um, it's not really appreciating like there's no capital appreciation for which you're, wait like, like, I guess in a sector uh, like if you're not buying the commodities right you're playing the cycle you're playing the cycle yeah you buy at the lows and then you sell at the highs okay. when so different sectors you are playing it differently so in for example the commodity you are playing the commodity cycle so in a cyclical cycle like banks mm. you are playing the cyclical cycle meaning banks um, they are the, the earnings, if you really plot it out, is cyclical in nature. So, why, why are banks cyclical? So banks are cyclical in nature because it follows the banks follow the health of the economy. So it goes follow, it goes through the mm-hmm. ebbs and flows of the cycle. Okay. So when like like likewise in the high interest rate environment, then DBS, OCBC are printing huge amount of cash flow. Okay. But don't forget, back then they were also not not very well to do. So if you plot it out, I think similarly for JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, like all the US banks, they are also very cyclical in their earnings. So they hate growth like, obviously because um, low interest rate. Yeah, they're not. They're, but oh, okay. yeah, in, in a way, yes, you can put it because a bulk of at least for DBS, their their income comes from name, which is net interest margin. Mm. The amount of money that they take, they give you 0.05 percent interest, and then they loan it out to businesses or they loan it out to individuals in oh, mortgages yeah. and whatnot. So banks are cyclical. Um, commodity, you're playing the commodity cycle. Commodity is not really necessary following the the economy because they have their own coal have their own coal cycle, tin have their own tin cycle, mm. silver, yeah, gold, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, um, if you look at it, uh, REITs, for example, REITs is a dividend play. So, right now, I think REITs also has a, a counter-reversion play. Meaning, if interest rate goes down, all the REITs will benefit. 
So people that buy REITs now, actually there might be a certain level of capital appreciation to, 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 to realize in a way where there might be a 50% to 100% upside. Yep, because yep. if you compare on the price to book level, some of them are one, two standard division away from their median. So if we really go back to like 2% interest rates, we might really see... Because they uh, start buying properties or like just freaking just... I think, no, not so much on that, but their interest because when they... A lot of them are very debt loaded. They're mm. loaded with a lot of debt because they, they buy all the properties. So right now they're paying, their interest keeps going higher because then their margins get squeezed. So got if the interest comes it. down, they read, they, they read, uh, yeah, yeah, re refinance. Yeah, refinance their got debt. It. Got it, then got it, got their it. margins go back up again. Okay. Yeah, and of course, let's not forget inflation, right? So all your capital land more, whatever, they own all these buildings, right? They're going to keep increasing their rent. So if you look at it, it's a double effect. Increasing rental prices and reducing interest margin. Then their DPU, which is their dividend, dividend per unit, will increase and then it will all revise upwards their what? At least that's my perspective as well. So I'm, got it, I'm, got in, it. I'm also in, in a few REITs, but a stronger REITs. And I'm also not only playing on the dividend play, but also on the reversion in, in terms of the prices. Got so it, got it. Okay. There's, there's a lot of ways to slice the, to, to skin the pig or skin yeah. the whatever. They yeah, there's too to many skin. ways, right? Yes. <laughs> Just focus on one. So, yeah. so I guess it's, it's your, your way of, of your, your, you, you kind of need to know what is your philosophy and how you approach the market and how you want to govern your portfolio in the, in the longer term. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any parting words for the audience? Uh, mm. And also, how, be, how should people find you? And please promote something. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually currently just run a YouTube channel now. You can just type in my name, Tae Chi King. So that's uh, one of the ways to find me. Um, I think generally, I, I do have a few parting words though. I think after this entire very long discussion, right? The first step to probably successful investing is to know yourself. And I think, I, I don't mean it in a very fluffy, very um, um, philosophical way to know yourself and to find yourself. But more so, after years of investing, I've been in this game for quite some time. So, uh, How many five, five, six years and so six years. five, six years and counting. I played a lot of nonsense ways. I started in the Singapore market. I was playing all the blue chip Singapore ways. And then I went to US and then I was trading. You know, back then I was looking at Apple and then Apple was in the 100 to 120 range and then, wow, you buy 100, you sell 120, you think you're very smart. I, I, I played, I recycled it for like two, three times. Okay. And then I realized that, hey, then Apple went up to 180, 190, 200. <laughs> so, so back, back then, I, I, I realized that once you play, the, 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 the market is a very expensive game. It's mm -hmm. a very expensive way to know yourself um, compared to like doing personal, personality tests. But I'm not saying that doing a personality test means that you know yourself, but um, start the game early start to know yourself earlier so that you can kind of hit the road bumps and to know the square away all the stupid mistakes out first so that I think when you are at a much better position, much better capital position, much better um, finance position, when you're in your 30s, mid-30s, late 40s, right? You will be in a much better position to govern or to direct a portfolio, to make the mistakes as early as possible, um, know yourself much better, um, be exposed to different investing philosophy, um, I'm doing value investing, not saying that it's the best way. Growth investing, not saying it's the best way. Some people like to do deep value, meaning they like to buy things that are deeply undervalued. Also not saying that's the best way, but if you know yourself better, if you have a better appreciation of yourself, then you can better conduct um, your portfolio in a grander scheme of things because when you really have a lot of money in, the, in, in like 20 years' time. So that's just my takeaway. And try, when you are younger, you can sway, but once you are, once you are very focused or once you are very clear of what you want to do, Try not to keep jumping around because like we talk about, right? High P has high PE um, spaces or, or in a particular snapshot, that's when growth investing flourished. In a particular snapshot, that's when value investing flourished. So try to stay, stay true. Once you understand yourself, you know the philosophy inside out, stay true to the entire conviction. And I think to be very, very honest, your portfolio wouldn't disappoint you. If, you. if you really appreciate the essentials of your investment strategy and to hold it long term, I think markets will pay off if, if you know what you're doing. So that's just my general thoughts and and kind of, yeah, my, my appreciation of the market after after yep. five, six years. Yep. Uh, you wanna drop your yep. like YouTube name? Uh, uh, that yeah, it's just, it's just my name, <laughs> Tichi Okay. Yeah, Ken. so, all right. So yeah, that's, hope you guys enjoyed the discussion. Ken. Thank yeah. you, Tichi for your time. And uh, hope, thank you for providing value to the audience. I hope it's not too long-winded, <laughs> to be very, very honest. So yeah. Okay, yeah. Ken. Thank Thanks. you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.